<laughs> okay. All right, so hello everyone and welcome um, to the talk about the Blender Studio Pipeline. So, some quick words about me before we start so you know who's talking here. I'm Paul, I'm currently still uh, finishing my diploma as a technical director at Animationsinstitut in Germany. And in between, uh, I was working here in Amsterdam at the Blender Studio as a year as a pipeline GD. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you some insights on how the pipeline at the Stand uh, Blender Studio works. So what might set this pipeline apart from others is that Blender is literally used for almost everything. And this is actually quite an unusual scenario because in a normal pipeline you often work with many different DCCs and a big part of the pipeline's job is to manage the data flow between those. But at the Blender Studio we don't have that requirement. And what I will show you in this talk is how we can actually take advantage of that. So how we can take advantage of how Blender works at its core, how it manages data and design our pipeline around that. So I'm going to start uh, talking about the editorial workflow at the Blender Studio. Blender has a built-in editorial environment called the uh, uh, Video Sequence Editor. And this is very unique amongst other DCCs and opens up very interesting opportunities. And we then will hop over to um, our review workflow. I'm going to show you a fun little add-on that has helped us to judge sequences as a whole. After that, I'm going to introduce you to Blender application templates by showing you an example that turns Blender in a cross-platform media viewer that also has some basic review tools. And last but not least, we will have a look at the new iteration of the Blender Studio's asset pipeline um, that is really designed around Blender. And I will talk about the system and sort of explain how it enables artists to work on the same asset at the same time. So, as I already mentioned, Blender has a built-in editorial environment called uh, the Video Sequence Editor. I'm sure everyone knows it and loves it in this room. And it has a very wide range of editing tools, and it was actually used to edit all um, past Blender open movies. And like all other parts, um, the, the Video Sequence Editor also has an extensive Python API, and this highly scriptable editorial environment can be very well integrated in a pipeline. For Sprite Fright, the Blender Studio also switched from their in-house production management suit Attract to Kitsu. And for the Blender Studio, Kits Kitsu is really like the hub in which all information about the production can be found. And the shortlist on Kitsu is basically the edit in a spreadsheet format. And it's very important that Kitsu is always up to date and synchronized with the edit that we do in Blender. Otherwise, you end up with mismatching data, which opens up the space for errors further down the pipeline. But imagine our editor has to adjust frame ranges on Kitsu every time he trims a shot or it gets shifted. So what we are essentially looking for is a system that sort of serves as a bridge between the editorial department and Kitsu to exchange data. And that's what we de uh, developed the Blender Kitsu add-on for. So with the add-on, uh, you can log in to Kitsu from within Blender. You can then go ahead and link a movie strip uh, to a shot on Kitsu. And once a movie strip uh, is linked to a Kitsu shot, we can exchange data between the two. For example, by updating frame ranges, thumbnails, uh, shot name, and other data without even having to leave Blender. And um, the great thing is that the whole system is selection sensitive. So you can update frame ranges and thumbnails of all shots in your edit with just a click of a button. And one important aspect to really get right is frame ranges. You don't want animators to animate less than they should or worse, animate more than they should. And everyone who already transferred frame ranges uh, by hand knows just how quickly you can switch up numbers. So this um, add-on just helped a great deal to automate this process. And when artists then worked on shot files, we actually had tools in place that would validate the current frame range with Kitsu and you get like a warning and you can update your frame range. 
So in this case, uh, we took advantage of Blender's sequence editor um, and made managing shot metadata a whole lot easier by doing it directly with the raw data of the edit. Another fun little add-on I want to share is uh, the context sheet add-on. Uh, this project came to life because we wanted to have a quick way to get an overview of a whole sequence. And it's especially useful for the lighting and comp department uh, to validate whether the shots in a sequence look consistent and harmonious. So with another add-on, add you can quickly uh, load all shots of the whole sequence and the contact sheet add-on then just takes a continuous uh, sequence of the topmost movie strips and assembles them in this grid view. And you can also just manually select the movie strips you want to have um, in your contact sheet. And everything it's doing really is uh, it's using the video sequence editor's Python API and a little math to scale and transform the movie clips. So this is just another small example um, what you can do with the video sequence editor and its uh, Python API. All right, the next project is a little bit more than just an add-on. The media viewer is actually an application template uh, that turns Blender in a cross-platform video, image, and text viewer. With uh, an application template, you can actually ship your own key maps, startup files, um, user preferences, and you can even define template-specific add-ons and modify parts of the Blender user interface all in one bundle. And the great thing is that you can easily switch between these templates without having to override uh, your own personal configuration or requiring a separate Blender installation. That means people can actually build their own applications on top of Blender that can be easily distributed. And by the way, you maybe heard it at the keynote of Ton, the project application templates is amongst the strategic development goals of the Blender project this year. And the Blender Media Viewer was actually an attempt to see how far we can push the system. And it showed some shortcomings. And hopefully at the end of the year, uh, we will get some exciting updates. So let's have a look at what the Media Viewer can do. So as I said, the Media Viewer offers the solution to have a player that can seamlessly browse media files with the arrow keys uh, on your keyboard no matter if they are video, image, or image sequences. And this application template reduces the Blender UI to a bare minimum by removing all elements that are not needed. And it ships with its own key map that adds useful shortcut to actually make it use usable without a mouse. And in the background, it actually switches dynamically between the Blender image editor, uh, sequence editor, and text editor, depending on what type of file was selected. And it even has some basic review tools um, so you can annotate your media and also export them with uh, just a click of a button. And the really exciting point here is that you can basically use Blender to build your own applications. So you can make use of all the open infrastructure um, of Blender that was built over years, like its ability to read and display all kinds of codecs, like multi-layer XR support, and you just wrap it in an application template that serves a specific purpose for you. All right. Um, the last section will be about the asset pipeline of the Blender Studio. The foundation of the asset pipeline was established during the Settlers project, and it was further iterated on during the production of Sprite Fright. And the asset pipeline is really designed around two core concepts. First, we want to take advantage of the way Blender stores data. And second, we want to enable artists to work in parallel without having to wait uh, for output of another task. And the second concept is kind of the result of the first, so let's jump a bit more into detail. So in order to understand how the asset pipeline is built, it's worth taking a quick look on how a blend file is actually structured. You can think of a blend file a little like a database. It is composed of data blocks, each storing different kinds of data, and these data blocks can reference each other, creating some sort of a hierarchy. And those data blocks can also be appended or linked in from other blend files, as I'm sure most of you know. And in the asset pipeline, we take advantage of this principle. So let's talk about task layers. Um, in order to get our asset pipeline running, we need to create a configuration file in which we define how an asset is assembled. And we do that through these task layers. Each task layer owns a domain of data 
and all of them together describe the entire data of an asset. So in this example for uh, here, the rigging task layer, it might, might own collections, objects, their relations, and object data. The shading task layer might own material assignments, UVs, uh, vertex colors, and the grooming uh, owns particle systems or hair. And what you can see here is that these task layers, uh, they can depend on each other and overlap. In this case, the shading task layer uh, actually needs the data of the rigging task layer because without objects, uh, there can be no material assignments. So there's a dependency between them. And a second uh, important concept is that these task layers, they can be pulled in from different sources by following a set of merge instructions that describe exactly how all these layers are puzzled together. And last but not least, task layers can be locked or live. A locked task layer uh, cannot be changed anymore, meaning the data it owns just stays the same. And a live task layer, on the other hand, uh, can still be updated. So, with the last three slides in mind, let's have a look at what an asset directory actually might look like, and I will try to break it down for you. So, we have a couple of asset task files here on the top, and some asset publish files or versions uh, on the bottom. I might use the term version and publish interchangeably, but they refer to the same thing. So, so far, pretty good and actually pretty common. And in each file, you have a colored representation of our task layer definitions that we did for this whole project. So, green is rigging, um, red is grooming, and violet is shading. So, tasks can publish the selected task layers to asset versions. But notice that a change will actually be published to all versions in which the selected task layers are in the live state. So in this example here, if the shading task layer gets published, it will actually be published to version two and version three, because in both of these versions, the shading task layer is still in the live state. So that's a super important concept to understand, which also differentiates the system from classical versioning, because a published version can still change, and when we publish a task layer, we might actually alter multiple versions at the same time. And so if certain parts of asset versions are live and therefore still get updated, in which case do we actually create a new version? We create new versions only on breaking changes. And this enables us uh, the following scenario. Let's say the rigging department wants to push a change that would break animation in a number of shots. They would actually create a new asset version. And during the creation of the new version, all rigging task layers um, of all the previous asset publishers get locked automatically. Um, and this creates backward compatibility because that way the animation of all the shots that still reference the previous asset versions would not be affected because the rigging task layer of those versions got locked and therefore didn't receive the change. So they still have the legacy rig, so to say. But the shading task layer uh, is actually still live in the previous asset versions, which means they will still receive regular shading updates. Um, so we can actually render a shot that references version three with the latest uh, shading of the asset, and we don't have to worry about our animation being broken when we open uh, a shot three months later that references this version of the asset. Um, a task file can also push multiple task layers at the same time. However, it makes sense to create one task for each task layer so artists can work in parallel as much as possible. And one important aspect in this scenario is that artists need to keep the other task layers on which they are not working on up to date. Um, because the shading task, for instance, is responsible for um, material assignments, um, shaders, UVs, and other things. But whenever the rigging task publishes new changes, new rigging changes, the shading task should make sure to get these changes as well. Otherwise, it might maybe miss an object uh, or shades an object that does not even exist anymore. So for this reason, it's important to perform a pull before a publish. 
uh, when artists pull the other task layers, they always pull it from the latest asset publish. So this is all automated by the pipeline and makes sure that the task files here on the top are always as close as possible to the latest asset publish version. All right, there was a lot to chew on, so let's just watch a little video on how this thing actually looks like in practice. So here on the left side, we have our artist in a task file. He does a shading change. He initiates the publish. And here in this case, only version 4 uh, will be affected because version 4 is the only publish that has a live shading task layer. He then applies the change. On the right side, we have our ANR character here. Uh, we just reload the file and you see the shading change got applied. It looks very simple, works as you would expect, but there's actually a whole lot of stuff going on in the background, this whole merging process. And in a few slides, we will have a more detailed look at that. All right, so we touched up on a lot of core concepts and theories about the asset pipeline. So um, in the next five minutes, we will actually see how all of this is sort of implemented. So it's going to get a little bit tacky at the end, but I hope you can handle it. Um, the asset pipeline relies on metadata to establish all kinds of concepts, states, versioning, and other things. And this metadata will be saved in the XML format uh, next to the file the data actually belongs to. So that way we define a clear and self-contained system which does not rely on any external online database to track or sync changes. And an XML file is also human readable and easily editable. So with that, we end up uh, with an asset directory that looks something like this. You can see we have a standard working and published directory, and each file has its corresponding uh, metadata file. And the last part of the asset pipeline will be about the asset builder, which is actually the component that contains all the logic of how to merge these task layers together. And the asset builder gets as input a list of task layers that should be pulled or published. In this case, we want to publish the rigging task layer. So the goal is to create an asset that's composed of the rigging task layer from A, but every other task layer from B. And if you remember earlier, task layers are dependent on each other. So just switching out uh, the rigging task layer of B with A doesn't work. We have to reapply all other task layers in the following step. And this is exactly what happens um, in the publish file during the merge process. So we import our asset from the task. We now have two asset containers, the one from the task and the one that's already in the publish file. And now it's time to decide which one are we going to take as a base. And in this case, we will take the task as the base as we publish the bottommost task layer that has the order zero, the green one. And if the bottommost task layers would actually not be amongst the task layers being pu pushed, we would use the publish as the base. And deciding for a base means literally duplicating the asset container. So we duplicate the asset container, um, which is going to be our target asset container here in the middle. And we then just go ahead and merge all these task layers in order uh, from their respective source. And as a final slide, to wrap it all up, uh, here we can see actually a picture of how these merge instructions of task layer look like. So this is also the configuration file uh, you can define per project. That means you can actually completely freely set up your own system of task layers. And, but of course, all together, these task layers, they have to make sense because at any publish or uh, pull, every task layer's transfer data function is executed in order. So everything a pipeline TD has to do here is to implement this transfer data function for each task layer. And you don't have to worry about all the logic from the previous slide, like when to transfer uh, from which asset container to the target. It's all abstracted away and happens automatically in the background. And when you implement the transfer data function, you work with the direct mapping from source to target. And for that, you have some very handy arguments prepared for you, like the transfer mapping, um, which is just basically a big dictionary um, that gives you a mapping between the source and target objects, materials, and collections. 
So with this already set up, you can basically just loop through those and perform your own logic. All right, you made it. <laughs> the, we reached the end of this presentation. Um, I know this was like probably really a lot to take in, uh, but I try to break it down as digestible as possible. And the great thing is that all of this is open source, so uh, you can just download and try out all the tools and way more uh, that I showed in this presentation at this link here. And yeah, thanks for your attention, everyone. <laughs>